This week, Megan's Megacan goes gin crazy to settle the ultimate head-to-head, -head, Bombay Sapphire or Gordon's. And boy, do they need it. Not only is Berlin about to get an actual boomer racist as its new mayor, with the SPD and the CDU getting cosy, but they have to get their heads around the Northern Ireland Protocol and the Windsor Framework and the Stormont Break. Thank God Irish political analyst Daniel Farrell is on board to explain. Slancher. And it's time for another episode of Megan's Megacan. I'm here with Conrad. Werner, hi Conrad. Hello. Expert in her magazine as well, though they're not in the room. Yeah. Which is just as well. That'd be weird to be <laughs> a lot of people. But we do have lovely Daniel Farrell. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Daniel is back on the podcast because he is a super savvy political analyst who works for an institution and is also... <laughs> Our Brexit expert. So when Brexit shit starts happening, <laughs> that Conrad and I yeah. don't understand, <laughs> we make Daniel come in and do it. O older listeners may be able to remember that we once had did a lot of Brexit episodes in we 2018 did. and 19. In the early years of the Megan's Megacan, we did a yeah. quite a few Brexit episodes. Yeah, I don't know did. why. And Daniel was on one of them. Yeah. Which yeah, was really helpful. Was. To talk about the the Northern Irish issue, the is Northern funny. Irish, the Irish, <laughs> the Irish question, and we have to say Ireland when we do it because okay. British politicians can't roll their R's. <laughs> it's really funny, <laughs> Ireland. Well, we're going to get on to talk about what the hell's happening in Northern Ireland, but I one hundred percent need alcohol for that. So, right, let me talk you through what we have today, Maggie Can Wise, because. We're going to talk about the Windsor framework, which Irish Twitter, Northern Irish Twitter, is making a lot of fun of because people have called it the Windsor framework because we're desperately trying to get the Protestants to agree to it, the super broads. So I was thinking, we definitely need the gins with Queen Victoria's face on them. <laughs> but, so hang on, we've got our lovely, um, oh no, Nico, our little cat. So I have one can with Queen Victoria's face on it, which mm -hmm. is the Bombay Sapphire. But as you will see, it's only 250 mils and there's Ooh. no way I was getting through talking about the fucking second Northern Irish protocol on 250 <laughs> mils. So what we are doing today is we have the Gordon's gin and tonic for normal drinking. And we're gonna do a taste test. Are we okay. excited? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're gonna the most we're, British okay. of drinks. We've never done this before. We're gonna no. you're gonna pour this these drinks into a glass. We're each gonna have our own G and T, like okay. normal size. Okay. okay. There you go, Daniel. Thank you. And then I'm gonna pour us Thank you. some Queenie V. Mm-hmm. Vicky Vicky Queenie. And then we're gonna rate which brand of gin and tonic in a can we like best. Is that the deal? Is that what we're gonna do? Yes. <laughs> okay. Lovely. I this Bombay one, to be clear, used to come in the bigger size. It's inflation. The Sapphire one and the Bramble one, which are both del delicious, but they're, they're really fancy and they come only in 250 mils to the best of my knowledge. I've only ever come in 250. But this one, it's lost its way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks like uh, the kind of can you would used to get on an aeroplane. Those tiny little cans. And I think, to be honest, pouring this into a glass, a gin and tonic mega is the only one I would pour into a glass. I worry the other ones are like fluorescent green. <laughs> okay, so all right. We're are starting we off with the Bombay Sapphire. Uh, yeah, why not? Okay, cheers everyone. Okay. Cheers. cheers. Oh, it actually smells quite good, yeah. this one, as opposed to radioactive waste, which the other ones. Yeah. I really like this one because it's yeah. really yeah. dry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not too sweet at all, is it? It's got a slightly sweet aftertaste, but Ooh, yeah, <laughs> what are we doing right now? Oh, okay. <laughs> Do we have to finish this first and then no, start talking no, about the I news? No, no, I think we or? can double fist. Okay. okay. When we finish this... We can this, double then... fist on Megan's Mega Can and we've now got fancy <laughs> mic stands and everything. We don't have to move around. We've got three microphones. We're professional podcasters. Uh, God, yes. <laughs> we can have two drinks. God, this is going to set a danger. <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> like my drinking mega and my tasting mega. And because we, we do need to talk about something first, because it has been important business I don't in Berlin. Want to? <laughs> because this week the 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 CDU and the SPD decided 
that they were going to start opening um, coalition negotiations. We should update. If anyone is just relying on their news from us, we've left a long time to tell you that the results of the Berlin oh. state election, which we ran again, Berlin state elections 2.0, were basically a disaster for the SPD. They lost... They didn't win a single constituency. Am I right with that? Uh, no, they won four direct uh, seats. Sorry. Um, but it was still a disaster. Yeah. The the picture of Berlin is all black around the edges for the CDU yeah. and then green in the middle where the Greens yeah. won most of the direct seats in yeah. the middle. So where really we are. interesting demographically to look at that. But of course, now we've been doing the coalition dance and you're about to tell us what has become of us all in the last couple of days. Yeah. So uh, after after much uh, hand wringing, because the three possible combinations had a majority, so the current government of uh, SPD, Greens, and the Linker had a majority, mm-hmm. had the biggest majority, in fact. The CDU and the Greens would have had a majority, yeah. and the CDU and the SPD would have had a majority. And <sighs> what has happened is that they well, they they all have to come together and decide, you know, whose policies match the best. And is that really what they do? That's what they... Well, who will make it... You know, where will the deal be most likely? Interesting. They talk about Schnittmengen in German. You know, Schnittmengen? So, how do you translate? Which is like overlap in policy? Yeah, overlaps. Yeah, in policy. Where do we have poli- oh. policy overlaps? Yeah. So they decided... The CDU, um, because they're the biggest... They won the election, so they have the biggest say in this, and they kind of decided they would prefer to have a coalition with the SPD rather than the Greens. And the SPD, under Francisca Giffey, the current mayor, it was is apparently open to this. She said, yes, I agree. Oh, she is a power-hungry little weasel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you say power-hungry, but this, of course, does mean that she will lose her job. Uh, if she could have... if she Oh, did, that's true, actually. If so, she'd have plumped for the red green red she would have kept her job right but she has also obviously said i would like a seat in cabinet um <sighs> so she is like she's not completely giving up you know her for her so, her, her position for her riddle, principles <laughs> riddle me this because i haven't really been following this nor do i understand it to my mind surely it would have made most sense because they had the biggest majority mm-hmm. they were already they've done the coalitions thing why not Red, red, green. Continuing. What? What? Why not? Daniel. Who wants I mean, to I think that? I suppose partly because the CDU <laughs> did so much better than the other two. I mean, the CDU got like twenty-eight, and the other two got about like the SPD yeah. Greens got about eighteen each. So I suppose they were so far ahead of the other two um, that, that there's a kind of a sense that obviously if the CDU are that far ahead and they clearly won, or they were clearly they the, have to be the biggest party that they should yeah. at least get the first shot at trying to form a coalition. Ah, uh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, is that's that the... official or is that just like... No, no, that, there's nothing official about that's that. Just that's just convention. convention, I think, yeah. But um, God, yeah. But that is what... Civilized. Sorry, <laughs> this is actual politicians being like, why don't we have civilised <laughs> meetings? Because we're going to get on to <laughs> where these questions from me are coming. I'm mm-hmm. like, why don't they just be complete dicks mm-hmm. about it? Yeah. So uh, uh, Giffey, this is what Giffey argued, in fact, was that she said that, um, that, that, that you know, the CDU... The, 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 the was she had like that they won morally they won the election mm-hmm. and because they won the most votes and, not and, morally <laughs> they just fucking wiped the floor with you mate and, numbers right well they just won this. yeah they won <laughs> so a win's a win and uh, yeah, that's a moral victory for mm, it's just, just uh, yeah and all three of the other parties lost votes Aye. so they all said, okay even okay. though that together they would still form a, a, a bigger majority amongst themselves that they 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 all can't really claim a mandate from from the mm-hmm. population in the same way. Anyway. Right. Okay. And I can understand... But some people would also say, and a lot of people have said, is that, in fact, uh, Francisca Giffey was never really that happy with the Green-Red coalition. Mm. She would actually... She's a bit more of a conservative. Mm. She's in the SPD spectrum, and she actually preferred this kind of coalition. So, uh, in fact, she did. I mean, it's on record. She did prefer a coalition with the CDU. But... Another but the users, you know about the users? No. The U- Junge Soziale, the Junge, ah. Junge Sozialisten, the Young SPD yeah. group, they put out a big, a big combative tweet this week saying, 
we have made our feelings clear. We do not want a coalition with the CDU, and we will fight tooth and nail within the party they, 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 and, uh, to prevent this happening. So they, the, the young socialist group in, okay. within the SPD are already um, have already kind of declared, not declared war, because that sounds horrific, yeah. but <laughs> declared yeah. like they're, they're going to fight this. They're not going to yeah. go the, gentle into the, that. Federal Could. users also said that in 2018, after the yeah. 2017, after the, na- the last federal yeah. election against mm. the SPD CDU coalition that didn't go anywhere. Like the C- the SPD yeah. members overall still voted for the coalition. So I know. remember that they didn't want the yeah. Kroko. Yeah, was that the like don't be a Kevin thing? Was that bad? Uh, yeah, it was Kevin Crooner who kind of led the campaign. He was the leader of the users at the time. Yeah. Where did it... anyway? Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Fine. So we'll wait Anything and see what else happens. I need to hear about this because I really, I just, I'm so. <laughs> we'll wait and see is basically what's gonna what will happen. I. Uh, um, it's amazing, but like in some ways, fair play to Giffo to have that damaging a defeat and still be like. I get to decide. <laughs> I let's do this. And the other thing is that it means that we're gonna have probably gonna have Kai Vigno as our mayor. I haven't even looked at him. Oh, he's a bit of a racist, should be said. I think this is why... (laughs) You might need that second cup. Yeah, let's open... Right, hang on, we're going to do our taste test. Stop, don't tell me anything more about this Kai motherfucker. All right, so... Okay, so, is this Gordon's and Tonic? No, just drink that either. Oh, it's like, okay. Yeah. Oh, we all just drink out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we've all yeah, got yeah, our own. Like, this is yeah, interesting, because yeah. usually oh, I find sorry. this yeah. one quite dry yeah. and nice, but I think following that one, this one kind of tastes sweet. I actually prefer this. It's, it's oh. a bit sweet. I prefer the Gordons, I have to say. Did you just pour it into your other one? No, I drank. I finished the other one. He drinks fast. Mm-hmm. But I um, made a mess on the... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> You've just poured that oil on our <laughs> monitor, the one it's that we fine. bought, like, a nice new monitor with it's, our lovely it's, it's Patreon money. <laughs> and we just poured mega all over I mean, it fits. <laughs> there, look, I've put the coaster you on. No, you've put a coaster on. Yeah, that'll solve. That's going to solve the fucking problem. <laughs> it's fine. It didn't go in any of the... <laughs> It didn't go in any of the Thanks, holes. Thanks, sponsors. Your money is like so <laughs> well spent. It's fine. It didn't go into any of the microphone holes. Into the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I feel ready to talk about Kai Wigner yeah. now. So Kai Wigner, I think the reason why the, I, the CDU won this election is because of the Sylvester Nacht Krawallen. I yeah, which I wasn't here for, so I. Oh okay. Missed. This is my thing because it became like a national news story for a week. In mm. Berlin, there, there'd been all this trouble in Berlin, and, and naughty kids have been throwing fireworks at firemen, <clears throat> and all this other stuff. And you know something needs to be done. And I think the CDU and especially Kai Wegner made a big deal of this and about you know like this is going to be you know law and order and everything. And very controversially at the time, he demanded that police release the first names of all the people who had been arrested. Now, why would you need to know the first names of them? Because everyone was saying, oh, they're all German citizens and everything. So what's the problem? And then they were like, yeah, but... And, and Kai Wigner came out and he said that he made this thing, said um, the police should release the first names of everyone that has been arrested. Hinting, of course, that he meant like people with uh, Muslim first names. And this became a big thing. And then Friedrich Merz, the federal CDU Shite leader, back. he took this up and he said he, he, he came out with this thing on the uh, on a talk show about declining and Pashas. Have you heard of this? About the little Pashas, like naughty kids in um, <sighs> in primary school who were from Muslim families. Like it was kind of like a, it was like a racially it was, race, it was racist. It was a racist debate that started. I really should not have missed this. <laughs> and I did. Fuck. What? So Friedrich Merz was on a TV show when they were uh, in the week after Sylvester, where he said the real problem is that uh, there are these children in primary school who do not respect their teachers, especially their female teachers, and uh, then when they come in, then uh, and and then he said he this this phrase came out where he said um, the little pashas basically saying that like, Muslim kids are naughty and and they grow up to then throw fireworks at policemen. That was sort of the tone of the debate and I think that is what is most depressing about this election. I knew that there had been this kind of like, yeah. like I, I knew the brush, the broad mm-hmm. strokes of it, but like, fuck! 
say what you want about UK politicians, but ain't no one, like, it's stupid enough in Westminster. Like, or even just... How is this the level of debate we're having? Also, if you want to talk about first names, how many fucking Stefan A's, B's, Ed? We've got all halfway through the alphabet of Stefans who fucking committed mass murder. Well, exactly. Brilliant. Class. So he's running the show, is he? Fantastic. So Kai Wigner is, I think, the, 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 it was after that. This is what was most depressing about the election result, is it was after that that the CDU started um, opening a, a lead against the other two parties. And I think that's what helped them to win. I don't think they would have had that, won it by that much if it hadn't been for that, that whole thing. So that was pretty depressing, if you ask me. Yeah, so that's Kai Wegner. And yeah, I mean, we don't really know exactly what policies. He also ran the other thing that he was running on in his platform was the whole thing about um, the die Verwaltung, you know, the administration of Berlin is such a disaster. And he said, we, and, and if you vote for the SPD again, you're just gonna, it's going to be a continual disaster. And it is a disaster. I mean, everyone knows. It is, but I don't think that's a party. No, and. <laughs> And no, and it's not something that the CDU C- you are going to get in there and digitalize the fuck out of everything. Yeah, the new fax machine. <laughs> and yeah, and especially because the CDU is, a cons- you know, they're, they're the party that's not going to spend yeah. any money. I mean, of any party, they're not going to invest in new bureaucracy because they're always about saving money. So I don't know. I don't. Anyway. I think I it said this before, like, thing, it was yeah. just such a cynical, and that was even before I knew about this, like, the literal stuff that's been said about, like, releasing first names of people who've been arrested, not even people who've been charged. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not legal. <laughs> you can't do that. Okay, great. So that's all I really wanted to say. I'm finished now. So the the GroKo, the, gro, the oh, Große I, Koalition. Is oh, we the, could talk about the Bundesrat. That was the other thing. Do you want to know about the Bundesrat? There's only so many hours in the day. How many of them have we used talking about these conservative nightmares? Maybe I Daniel just... can help us here. Daniel, you've oh, been to Daniel, the Bundesrat. Oh, Daniel, talk about the Bundesrat. I've, I've, I've done the tour of the Bundesrat twice and I st- still don't really understand how it works. <laughs> so that might tell you something about my level of expertise, but let's see what we can do. <laughs> so the fact that the Berlin government is changing also means that the makeup of the Bundesrat is changing. The Bundesrat is the, the other house of the German Parliament is made up of the state governments, the sixteen state governments. Mm-hmm. And Daniel's been there. What's it like? It's just, I mean, it, it feels just like a Parliament building, basically. Okay. I mean, that's you know, um, it's some old Prussian something or other um, mm-hmm. in Mitte, kind of near Potsdamer Platz. Um, and I mean, the actual chamber is quite small because the numbers are quite small. Mm. You know, so each state has a number of seats based on its population. And I mean, I think I suppose NRV as the most populous state has the most seats, but like it's not, it's okay. pretty small numbers and they, they only meet like once a month or something, don't they? And then they basically, they basically have to debate everything that has already gone through the Bundestag or something to give yeah, it Yeah, but approval. it's not. I mean, it's effectively an upper house, even though maybe we shouldn't call it that, but it is effectively that, like it's a yeah. second chamber of parliament. Okay, yeah, because so, yeah. when things go through the Bundestag, they always have to go to the Bundesrat but for yeah. approval yeah yeah okay and the, so now there's going to be more CDUers in there that can only mm-hmm. be good yeah and the thing is we haven't yes. really heard much about the Bundesrat in the last 16 years mm-hmm. because for most of those 16 years there's been a a GroKo under Merkel with uh, the SPD and the and the CDU uh-huh. and there's a convention that those parties don't block each other's legislation so whoever is in federal government... Ah, now I see what you so, mean. So, so yeah, so the, the federal government has the, um, you know, they, they control the parliament, obviously. Like they, whoever's in the federal government, they yes. have the biggest, yes. they have the majority in the Bundestag. And those three parties are not supposed to block each other's legislation in the Bundesrat. It's kind no, of a convention. Weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... That's why we haven't really heard much about debate in the last 16 years, because it's always been pretty easy oh, to get shit. laws through. So mm-hmm. are we going to get but, stuff through the Bundestag? But now, because the CDU is no longer in the federal government, and they have a lot of seats in the Bundesrat, they have the potential to block federal laws, like Olaf Scholz's laws. And they can do that, uh, and, and, and they're more likely to do that now because they control the Berlin government, because then they have an extra, I think it's an extra four seats which gives them an, another um, an extra bit of uh, oh, power. Oh, no, there. we're all going to have to go yeah. on a tour of the Bundesrat <laughs> now. 
Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how much it helps <laughs> from, from personal experience. Maybe just buy a few more. Why have you been two times? <laughs> once was when I, I was doing my masters, like as part of that, they brought us all there. And once was some work thing. I think a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, they, they're they're delighted to have anyone in there because no one ever no one's ever interested in it. So anyone who comes in, they'll give you a tour. Like they're just Maybe happy someone's go. going. I do yeah. think we should like take yeah. the mega can on the on, on the tour. The I'm sure they'd love tour. it. Yeah. Do they let you yeah. drink in there? Are you if to- you bring in a wee coffee cup, no yeah. one knows there's a mega in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Top tip, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> a sippy um, cup. All right. So okay, you know. that's horrifying. Mm-hmm. There's some laws I really want to go through soon. Yeah, but the CDU probably doesn't want to go through, so... Oh, God, why do we keep... I do think it is a question to be asked, what's going on outside the ring? I don't know, it's just that same old debate, isn't it? Like, yeah. what's going on in the countryside? What's going on in East Germany? What's going on yeah. in their, their Bible states? What's going on yeah. in thing? And, all right, why don't we go over and talk about other... Th- weird political divides which are kind of different but also essentially the same because we're all humans and we can't escape our own natures yeah so conrad you texted me this week saying what's happening with the northern irish protocol (laughs) i said i don't fuck if i know so we called in daniel so just to obviously this is very important it's very important Mm -hmm. for the eu we're talking about this is a german politics show but Mm-hmm. I'm also from Northern Ireland, so, so. Can, you know, hopefully either see the relevance or yeah. just... Also, von der Leyen was there and she's German. She was. Yeah. <laughs> she so was. That in still her counts. jodhers and britches, <laughs> yeah. probably in her little crop. Oh, yeah. Um, so von der Leyen was there. So, now, let me tell you what I know, which is probably what most people mm-hmm. know. The UK has been wiggling around and not really happy with the Northern Irish Protocol yes. which was agreed a while ago and basically the the long and the short of the problems with the protocol is that because in order to keep the soft border on the island of Ireland so mm-hmm. that we don't get thrown back into the absolute fucking nightmare that was having a hard border there mm-hmm. as we all know well we know who were who were who were there in those mm-hmm. times with the barricades and all the bombing and shit. Mm-hmm. So we'd rather, yeah. we'd rather avoid, avoid that, that yeah. if possible. Yeah. And also because of the lovely soft border night, it's no longer practical. People work in one, yeah, yeah, yeah. live in the other, do this there, yeah. back and forth the whole time. Yeah. So what was agreed, to the best of my knowledge, mm-hmm. was that goods would then be checked coming from Great Britain, which is just the big island, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> to Northern Ireland. This, of course, creates various, I think, logistical issues, but also a ideological Mm -hmm. feeling issue Mm -hmm. for unionists and loyalists within Northern Ireland who feel like they have essentially now living on the other side of a border Mm -hmm. to where they consider like home, basically. Um, And I think that in some ways, that's a valid way to Mm -hmm. feel. So did the UK just start going like, we're not going to really do this? And then <laughs> they just kind of didn't do a lot oh, no, of it, yeah. basically. Yeah. So that's how. And then now yeah. it's come back to. And this is where my kind of okay. running. Yeah. Like I don't know what's happening. I have a vague idea. I saw like a drawing of what the new one is. Yeah. But they've come up with something. Rishi and von der Leyen. Yeah. Rishi and Urshi. Yeah. Have come together and just laying around talking about like being super rich I'd imagine <laughs> they're just like yeah mind you is Rishi a different kind of rich is he richer than definitely Richard's rich Rishi's rich I think his wife us, is really rich he like married into a really wealthy yeah, family yeah I think he's rich he? on his yeah. own wasn't I he I think he probably is by himself but he married into funds, like yeah really really rich I think yeah anyway yeah. then maybe yeah. they share share those people aren't sharing yeah. horses <laughs> what am I saying they're not sharing anything <laughs> um But they've come together and they've come up with something called the Windsor Framework. What is it, Daniel? And why? (laughs) What? I don't know. So, I mean, it's basically an attempt to recognize the the you know the, the problems a lot of people mostly unionists in northern ireland have with the northern ireland mm-hmm. protocol and it's a way to try to get everyone to agree and that they can move forward and implement everything yes sorry um, i should also say that in this interim we haven't had because of the northern irish protocol a government mm-hmm. again in northern ireland we never have a fucking government yeah. 
because the DUP, the two biggest parties, the DUP for once not the biggest party, mm-hmm. they wouldn't be first minister. That would be Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin, who won the last election. Mm-hmm. But the DUP, to the best of our, are refusing to form a government because of their objection because to the, the Northern Irish Protocol. Irish protocol. Exactly. Yeah. And the way we operate in Northern Ireland is if you don't agree with something politically, you get to just not do, do any anything. politics. Yeah. It's insane. So this is also trying to get Exactly, it's a way Storm to encourage back them in, to join in. the assembly or, yeah, to, and to get the executive up and running again. So what's in this deal? Framework. What what, what okay. has Rishi managed to... So it's, I mean, it's a lot of practical steps to try to remove those kind of those barriers that mm-hmm. led people to criticise it. So, I mean, the, the big one is the introduction of what they're called re- a red lane and a green lane for goods going from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. So any goods that will be staying within Northern Ireland that will be used within Northern Ireland will go through a green lane and will have way fewer checks. So effectively, like supermarkets and other companies can register as a trusted trader and have their goods. I saw that like more M&S less, will just Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just be like, it's grand your M&S, go. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, for your fancy cocktail sausages and everything. Um, yeah, so anything, but then anything that is effectively only for the North will be labeled as not for EU. So it'll only because they, th- those products yeah. will comply with UK standards, but not necessarily EU standards. I see. Then any goods that are or might are going to go or might go into the Republic of Ireland and therefore the EU will go through a red lane and they will be they will kind of have to undergo more checks Mm -hmm. effectively to be sure that they comply with EU rules because then there is no border between Northern Ireland and the Republic Mm -hmm. those goods could just cross the border into the Republic and therefore obviously the rest of the EU okay um There are some other things, and I mean, this is where I think some of the sort of identity issues have come mm. in, or like this idea that, you know, that, that obviously that, that unionists feel they are effectively, as you said, behind a border yeah. within their own country. So there were difficulties bringing pets in from Great Britain into Northern yeah. Ireland. Most of those kind of conditions are gone. So you can effectively just declare that your pet will be staying within Northern Ireland and then you can this bring it Northern in. This is a Northern Irish dog. More or less. Yeah, exactly. Class. <laughs> <laughs> um, then if you say, I'm going to bring it into the Republic, then it'll have to go through the full checks. There were other things around like people getting packages sent from from Britain into Northern Ireland. They'll now be that the UK has agreed to kind of share a lot more data with the EU on kind of the packet, the the traffic of packages and things like that. So that those those rules will effectively go. And medicine was another one so that, you know, you could theoretically have, let's say, some new experimental drug that the UK had approved Mm. for use that the EU might not have. And then it couldn't there was a chance Uh. that it might not be available in Northern Ireland. They've now agreed that the UK, including Northern Ireland, will be just treated as one single kind of medicines market. So Mm -hmm. only the UK rules will apply for anything there. Um, And then one of the kind of more complicated ones is this idea of the storm and break. Yes. Uh, This is where it gets a bit more (laughs) more technical. Half a mega plus (laughs) an extra mega deep. Let's go. I don't really understand this one. This is an attempt to get around what they're calling the democratic deficit. So the idea that obviously because Northern Ireland effectively remains within the EU for lots of things, Mm. but has no representation in Brussels, Mm. that they will have a way to at least slow down, if not stop any new EU rules that would come in that would affect Northern Ireland that they're not happy with. Mm -hmm. This is a sticking point, wasn't it, for the Northern Irish DUP? The whole yeah. Thing was, oh yeah so under this everything's a fucking <laughs> <story. laughs> you just gotta get your head like their slogan literally is mm. Ulster says no, no. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. is what they were born yeah. out of it is just That's like we don't know what it is but no no yeah. no, no. <laughs> so the storm and break so this will mean and th- this is where there's kind of also an incentive for the DUP to re-enter Stormont to re re kind of start the assembly and the executive because they can only kind of slam on the break through the Stormont Assembly. So if 30 members of Stormont agree that they want to put a break on the implementation of some new law, they get 30 of them together and then they tell Westminster that they want to do this, but they can only do this through Stormont. So they can only do it if they're actually, if they've re-entered, uh, re-entered the Assembly. Those 30 um, MLAs, they're called members of mm-hmm. the Legislative Assembly, uh, have to come from two parties. But mm-hmm. as it stands, I mean, the DUP already has has 25 seats. The UUP has nine, I think. So, I mean, it, you, it, it's not that you need a cross-community majority. I mean, unionists on their own would have more than enough to mm-hmm. to pull mm-hmm. this break. Okay. But it's th- this is where there's a lot of the difficulty about whether they really want to accept it or not, because the language is very... 
the diplomatic would be maybe the diplomatic way of putting it. Yeah. Like it's very, you know, they have to prove there's no way of saying how they prove it, but they have to prove it's a last resort that they're doing it. That they have to, it has to not be for trivial reasons, whatever they are, mm. and it has to be for a new rule that they can prove will cause like a long lasting impact on daily life in Northern Ireland. And again, how you define these things is very open. And even if they reach that threshold and they say to Westminster, hey, we want to stop this, it's then ultimately still up to the government in Westminster to say to decide whether they'll actually go to Brussels and say, we want to stop this. Westminster could say, we don't really believe you or we're not quite satisfied you've done this or we could maybe get this overridden by a majority of the MLAs in the assembly. Like there are 90 seats. So if 30 are against it, there can still be 60 people who are in favour of a, a new yeah. rule. Um, if Westminster is, is OK with pulling this break, then they go to Brussels and then Brussels and London then would have a negotiation in an independent kind of arbitration, not through the, the European Court of Justice, like not the ECJ, because the idea that the ECJ would have a role in Northern Ireland is also very controversial. Yeah. So this would be done through an independent the, the European Court of Justice. Panel. Uh-huh. That's been a big. That was also that's, a, that's big, a big, a big sticking point, point for the Brexit yeah. people. Yeah, absolutely, right. and I mean, um, the, the the role of the ECJ isn't completely gone in this, but it's certainly massively scaled back. And most issues in practice would probably end up being resolved through some sort of independent arbitration. But theoretically, there is still a role for the ECJ because the, the Brussels Brussels will never allow that to be given up because ultimately the the mm-hmm. arbiter of EU law is the ECJ, and the the EU is never going to give that up. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, Okay. <laughs> that's the so, kind of potted <laughs> description of it. That is, that's very good. Thank you. I think I now understand it. Mm-hmm. Did you see uh, Rishi Sunak appearing in that factory in Northern Ireland? Yeah. When oh, Jesus, he, where did he go? He went to some factory in Northern it's Ireland. the Coca-Cola and said, factory in Lisbon. And, yeah. Oh, the Coca-Cola factory. Yeah. And he was really excited. And he said, what you don't understand is that this is, this is so great for Northern Ireland because you'll be in the UK economic area and in the EU economic area and this will be unique in the whole world you remember that? <laughs> yeah. you didn't see that? Yeah. No, it was really funny because you just like well that was what the UK it had, had. <laughs> before <laughs> Brexit I that know, would have been this like this is the whole thing and now I've seen <laughs> yeah. like yeah. But anyway, Brexiteers yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. being like he was all delighted with yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this 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 new this yeah. new discovery. <laughs> yeah. It was like, well, <laughs> it's possible to yeah. be in both. Yeah. yeah, you can be in both. <laughs> but anyway, so you can <sighs> sell your um, yeah. Northern Irish Coca Cola in both markets. Yeah, <laughs> is the, is the yeah. upshot. I didn't know there was a Coke factory in Lisburn. Yeah. Well, there we go. There you go. Okay, so now we get into the what has to happen in order for this mm-hmm. to be to be approved basically. to be approved it's ha- yeah. like this is what i this mm. is literally what i don't understand yeah. i mean it, to be honest it's also still very open um there's i mean there's no official procedure for how something like this would have to be approved okay I think theoretically the uk government would have the power just to approve it right. and agree to it um like the rishi soon like the uk government they have said there'll be a vote in westminster on it there's no real risk of that not passing because as of now there hasn't been a sort of massive Tory rebellion against it um, and Labour have also said they, they're in favour of it they're uh-huh. saying you know we'll put country over party and we'll just vote for this it's also in Labour's interest to obviously get this issue out of the way before they possibly come to power in two years so they just want to get it dealt with so they have uh-huh. an interest in getting it done as well so uh-huh. I don't think there's any risk whatsoever of it not passing through Westminster um, obviously our old friend Boris Johnson could pop up and say he's he's kind of said he'll have a, he'll have difficulty voting for it for it but he hasn't actually said this he is, won't this is this is this is my point so there's yeah. various bodies that people keep talking about mm-hmm. are they going and this is the kind of drama yeah. like will they won't they yeah. yeah will the dup yeah first of all mm-hmm. will the what is it the erg, the ERG who the, the fuck are they the european research group they're just a group of tory mps who get Love. together? And, oh yeah, yeah. Love Brexit. Public, it's Reece Mark. Right. Love Reece Mark yeah. is the e, e, yeah. e, isn't he? He's, he's, yeah, he's. In I forgot about him. Yeah. Let's never yeah. talk about him. Yeah, they're the hardcore wankers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I mean, the ERG kind of do whatever the DUP tells them, probably. And yeah. then Boris Johnson, mm-hmm. who's obviously on his own little. The DUP, yeah. fair enough. Mm-hmm. It is important if this deal has been made, and and this is kind of one of the things that we're enjoying on Twitter because. The fact that they've called it the Windsor <laughs> framework, yeah. 
the fact that it was done in Windsor, they've kind of got Charles, King Involved. Charles, to yeah, wave yeah. his fucking scepter over yeah. whatever the fuck happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's all of that. Whatever the DUP do, the DUP, I do not understand. I don't understand them anyway. I am not in any way expert anymore on Northern Irish politics, but it does seem to me that they seem to be unable to act actually even in their own mm-hmm. interest because yeah. the DUP... And one of my major criticisms of them is that they don't really give a shit about working class loyalists Mm -hmm. who are always the people in Northern Ireland now who are sort of suffering the worst, who are Mm -hmm. left out of the most conversations, who have been the most kind of betrayed by the people who have been supposed to represent them. To be clear, I do not agree with the politics at all Mm -hmm. of working class loyalists, but Mm -hmm. you can think of yourself as British Mm -hmm. and live in Northern Ireland and and feel that that is really an important thing and that's fine. But the DUP are more about protecting sort of uh, traditional Protestant power of kind of like landowner like Mm -hmm. that kind of I don't I don't I don't know what they're for I don't because their policy I yeah yeah, yeah. what are they doing I don't I mean like I mean the DUP in one way they have themselves to blame for this because Mm. they did stoke fears around this and they've been the ones out kind of protesting against this having kind of agreed to in the first place but then they're also under pressure themselves from like the TUV the traditional unionist voice the sort of more extreme unionist Mm. party you know and it's for them to like there's dangers for them in accepting it as well I mean yeah if they were able to kind of chalk some of this up as a win and say look you know yeah we've been intransigent for three years and we've been driving everyone crazy but like ultimately they had to do what we said and we've got 90% of what we asked for let's take it they could do that but there's dangers in in doing that as well you know and I mean Rishi Sunak has basically you know he he hasn't said it explicitly he's kind of hinted that even if the DUP don't accept this he'll still let it go through and it'll become the law and it will be implemented but that doesn't resolve the problem of the DUP not being in the in the assembly or the the executive Mm. so you can you could resolve this issue which would maybe allow sort of London Brussels relations to yeah. develop and move forward but that won't actually resolve the Northern Ireland I issue I really hope that doesn't so, happen yeah. I hope that the thing but it is an interesting thing and I think it's sort of hard to understand if you're not and we're joking about like Ulster says no but mm-hmm. if you think about the history of like Protestantism yeah. and, and, and Britishness in Northern Ireland you yeah. have an entire culture and identity built out of the whether it is true or not mm-hmm. perception that you are a sort of Im- battled yeah, yeah you know your job your your identity is to hold this yeah, yeah. stronghold yeah, and yeah. not give in mm-hmm. to these outside yeah. forces like you are mm-hmm. there to maintain space maintain your right or, to yeah. be there yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. in yeah. your yeah, yeah yeah little plantation yeah. place or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever yeah the idea of of negotiation and and that kind of thing mm-hmm. is maybe particularly difficult for yeah. those parties and those politicians yeah. let's hope yeah <laughs> they do the right thing yeah, yeah um i mean like with with the you know with the issues around around the protocol and the, whatever the framework i mean you were saying that at the beginning some of them are kind of logistical and some are more identity based this certainly deals with the vast majority of the logistical ones but i i, mm. I can, you, you can still understand that from a union's point of view i mean you know, some EU laws will still apply in Northern Ireland, even though they're not part of the EU. You know, th- there will still be some checks on goods going between GB and NI. I mean, like from a sort of an identity point of view, I can see how people feel that they're, they're yeah. effectively been cut off. But I mean, you can also make that argument about nationalists in Northern Ireland. They're cut off oh, from their mother country, if you want to put it that way, of the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. They've been living like that for 100 years. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. being in Northern Ireland involves compromise on both sides. Yeah. And this goes yeah. a long way to resolving unions concerns. It doesn't resolve them all, but, yeah. but neither my, does any of this for anyone. So Yeah, and my, my worries, and I'm not really here to... <laughs> as Daniel <laughs> to like testament to after many of my drunken rights. I'm not here to defend the Northern Irish like Protestant position. But I also think that and this is also then again the DUP because they fail to form governments and they won't, they govern inefficiently and they have done for years and Northern Ireland, the health service is crippled. Mm -hmm. Public services are crippled. Nothing fuck works I love that country and mm-hmm. it drives me fucking demented yeah. <laughs> yeah. I go home I go to the pub I'm like 100% want to move back home this is mm-hmm. amazing this is where I would want to raise children and then I try and catch a fucking bus mm-hmm. 
and it's it's yeah. the whole thing is just demented and everyone is just kind of accepted about and for people who are in the you know your your working class DUP voters and 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 these things and when you've got so little and there's so fucking little going for you mm-hmm. and so little has changed in some communities since the Good Friday Agreement, I can sit here as a middle class person and talk about how mm-hmm. great it is and how we have more mm-hmm. mixing in schools and all of this stuff, but it doesn't, for certain communities, that is not yeah. the reality. And like, then you ask them to give up the one sort of thing yeah, that yeah. they have left. Go in, if you want to represent those interests, DUP, yeah, yeah. like fucking, your job is not to just defend the idea of and, and the ideology of unionism and loyalism. Mm-hmm. It's to look after the loyalists and the unionists and, and make sure make that they nice have like okay yeah. lives. You <laughs> yeah. fucking yeah. Exactly, yeah. So Northern Ireland hasn't had a, a, a government for several years, is that right? Ages, and you know oh, what's well, fucking like, shite? More than a year, I think now, yeah. What, is, what does that mean when you don't have a government? What have you, what's it like? I, I, mean, the, like the, I mean, the civil service can run the place day to day and then any decisions, any important decisions just kind of come from London. You know, it, it's hard for kind of agencies and stuff to launch new policies because it's not really, I suppose, appropriate after, you know, if there's not a government deciding yeah. it. So they're kind of just administering the place, but they're not right. really... Yeah. leading it or there's no one kind of properly governing and bringing and in like new thing, new, advocating for and the advocating rights of Northern Ireland and exactly, saying this yeah, is what yeah. we want and this yeah. is yeah. our vision for the future of our yeah. tiny little funny country yeah I mean on a practical level the best thing to do would be just go back into the assembly set up the executive and actually govern and try and improve people's so lives rather just than just show up and do their fucking jobs oh, I yeah. think yeah and they're all getting paid this oh whole time do not crisis, get so. uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no seriously like the poverty in Northern yeah. Ireland and this is the thing and like people will talk about how and a lot of business has mm. been and people say mm. well Northern Ireland's economy has actually mm. been quite good if you mm. are running a Northern Irish business mm-hmm. it's actually been great my brother was doing he worked for a small company mm-hmm. And he was kind of tasked then with figuring out when Brexit was actually like followed through, you know, whenever it came yeah, into yeah, yeah. being on that 1st of January, his yeah. job, we were all there at the Christmas holidays, just like, what does this mean for us? Yeah. And he was like, seems like we need to do nothing. Yeah. Nothing changes. It's brilliant. We're sending shit here, there. Because they were exporting from yeah, Northern yeah, Ireland. Yeah. So it was brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. for them. Yeah. But that's, to me... Yeah that's fine and Mm -hmm. the economy and business sort of like runs itself they don't need the government yeah yeah what needs the government is people who are relying on social services yeah yeah like the most vulnerable people Mm -hmm. and that's what people need to get in and fucking do so Mm -hmm. it's not just these like dwindling funds that no one ever bothers to go and renegotiate or re-divert or any of that stuff yeah yeah (sighs) yeah i mean there's just kind of a lack of leadership and a lack of proper representation for people who really need it basically and then every and then everyone just ends up focusing on this these kind of theoretical things of the ecj and this and that and i know that's important from an identity point of view but it's not actually going to improve yeah. anyone's life life yeah. yeah like no you know no and uh, uh can you say a little bit about what mm-hmm. this means for the eu why, why was it important for the eu yeah. to sort this out um, and how do you think <clears throat> ursula von der leyen did I suppose the EU just, I mean, the EU just is so sick of Brexit. They have enough other problems going on, you know, the war that's kind of going on down the road and things like you know, climate change, all these kind of slightly bigger problems. So I think they're just sick of Brexit and they want it done. And I suppose if you're, you know, approaching it from the point of view of someone in charge of a place with 400 and whatever million people, the the, the kind of concerns of There's one and a half million north. people in Northern Ireland. Not even one and a half million. It's yeah, about yeah, yeah. Of the people who actually, actually don't care. want this to go yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a few hundred thousand people exactly. who kind of if care even, about this, you yeah. know. So I think they're they they just want to get rid of it, and yet at the same time, you know, von der Leyen is under pressure from the other member states to be in, to be sure that they don't give away too much because, you know, the EU always has to sort of protect this the single market, and I mean, you can say, I mean, maybe they're a bit too extreme about this kind of obsession with protecting the single market and stopping goods coming in, <laughs> you know, that that might be dangerous. I mean, as, as if something produced in the UK is going to be some of massive danger to the the single market. But I mean, it's you know, from a legal point well, of view, we're all very scared of AstraZeneca um, for a while. Yeah, Let's exactly. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, I think it, it it's this yeah, trying to find the balance between getting it done getting it over with but also not actually giving away too much in that way Mm. um i mean there's been some kind of concern i think among member states that the eu might give away 
too much in that way that they would they would sort of weaken that way the protections of the the single market mm. and then you could have other countries like Switzerland or Norway or Turkey or something saying well if you're giving that to Northern Ireland why aren't you giving that to us you know so so that, that von der Leyen has had, she's had to kind probably of be fine they're probably like ah oh, it's because it's <laughs> terrible <laughs> there <Yeah>. fine <laughs> <laughs> Do, uh, um, like, do you ever go to yeah. the shop Nor- Broken English? Do you know the uh, shop yes, Broken do, English? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they yeah. sell uh, yeah. stuff that's supposed to be from the UK. And they now sell most of, loads of stuff from Ireland. Because well, of yeah. Brexit. All yeah. the meat products. Oh, yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the meat yeah. products. All the sausages. Yeah. It was always like Cumberland sausages. And yeah. it, all the English people would go, oh, I'd love a Cumberland sausage. sausage right now. Yeah. You go there now and they're all Irish sausages. Yeah, yeah. It's all clan of kilty and, and stuff, uh, I think. Yeah. Finally, the, yeah, col- yeah, yeah. the colonial <laughs> chickens are coming home to roost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I just yeah. thought that was interesting because you know because there's yeah. a big Union Jack on the yeah, on yeah, the door I'm, of the yeah, shop, and you yeah, think, yeah. oh, it's yeah. all going to be. Yeah. But I mean, that, English that's thing. one of those things that's a direct exactly. yeah. result of Brexit. It's like you yeah. cut yourself off from your your biggest and nearest market. You're not going. It's not going to be as easy to sell to them. You know that's no. that's God, exactly Brexit yeah. People. Jesus, yeah. What? Yeah. So the other thing that you do a lot of is mm-hmm. looking at like German press coverage mm-hmm. of things that are happening in uh, Ireland, and there has been a lot mm-hmm. of coverage, it mm-hmm. seems, of, of the Northern there's, Irish yeah, yeah, sort of thing. And a lot of interest in it, yeah. Like, what is Germany's take on this, and like? why do you think they're interested like why I mean, I know why we're discussing it on yeah, a German yeah. politics podcast yeah. I mean there's definitely like bemusement and just kind of yeah. like uh, the sense of I mean like the sense of like lads you've done this to yourselves with Brexit mm. you know you just have to deal with it but okay we still have all these issues and yeah we also unfortunately have to yeah. have to deal with it and I think there's, there's definitely a lot of respect in Germany I think for the Good Friday Agreement and I mean there's a a kind of a sense that yes you know it, it's it's hammered home every time a German politician speaks about this or in every article about it that like this is because we have to protect the peace process this is because we have to protect the Good Friday Agreement mm. because we have to keep an open border you know there, there is I think an understanding of that and I think it partly comes from the fact that I mean Germany also understands the EU as a peace project as well I mean it's not just mm. an economic union it's yeah. also I mean it, it was Germany's way of kind of um, rehabilitating itself after the Second World War so yeah. Germany also understands the whole project in that way as well as being about medicines regulation and sausages it's you know yeah. it was it was about that so they kind of get that point and they can see god all this was so much easier when the Republic the North and GB were all in the EU wasn't it you know so this is it's kind of like this is what happens mm. when you when you kind of try to break that and then all these other issues that aren't aren't directly related to the regulation of sausages but you know they, they, these things kind of come up again from doing yeah. that um so i mean it, it's definitely it's fallen way down the kind of like agenda in germany but there's definitely yeah. still a certain kind of yeah. level of interest in it um interesting yeah yes yeah. I was explaining it to the nurse that was trying to draw blood from me on Wednesday. That was interesting. Mm. <laughs> She's like, yeah. I think she was kind of interested, mm. um, but also just trying to keep me talking because yeah, I hate having blood taken. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, Tell me more about the Stormont break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, right, so mm. to sum up, yeah. We don't know if we're going to have a GroKo in Berlin, but we probably are going to, and I need to resign mm. myself to this fucking racist asshole governing our city. Yeah, Kai Wegener. Yeah. Yeah. At least it's a shorter term now because they fucked up the election the first time now. It's only three and a half years to the next election. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And... Uh, we also have another regional election coming up soon. Oh, which it, one? Hesse. I, Hesse? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Come what on, is, what is, Hesse. What, what is interesting about that is that um, the so the the, the ample the, the the coalition that governs the whole of Germany right yeah. now is hoping to win that election uh, and take it away from the CDU. Mm. So that would make up for losing the mm. Berlin votes in the Bundesrat if they win it. Ah, and, and is Hesse a seats, former? Probably. It's a bit bigger, yeah. It's former yeah. West. It's West. Yeah, West. Yeah, it's where Frankfurt right. is, so it's rich. <laughs> Ah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, yes, I know where Hesse is. Yeah. Sorry, I get mixed up with. We had we had a whole episodes about Saxon. Hesse. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, the reason why yeah. I'm so fuzzy is because we drink heavily. How yeah, yeah. are 
everyone's mega cans. Now, Good. we did a taste test. We did the Bombay mm-hmm. dry and tonic. So mm-hmm. Bombay has a few different gins. They have the Bombay Sapphire. They have that Brambly one, which actually I don't like those mixed children's drink gin things, but the Bramble is mm-hmm. okay. delicious. Yeah. Uh, but this is just their normal dry. And then we had Gordon's gin and tonic. What mm-hmm. are we thinking? I think I prefer the Gordons, mm. I have to say. I mean, I'm not really a gin person, but actually I think I prefer the, the Gordons. No, <laughs> no, yes. Poor Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, I'll still drink it. It's all right. Have some more gin, Daniel. I've definitely learned my lesson. Uh, after yeah. the first time so, I've drunk this a lot slow, more slowly. Yeah. It's, it's um, not the same as a beer. <laughs> I mean, Gordons tasted like a standard gin and tonic to mm. me. Yeah. You know, if I, I, if I ordered so. one in a pub. Yeah. A, just a normal pub I would, that is what I'd expect mm. to get whereas if I went really to which you can do here f- say no. a lot about the UK Northern <laughs> Ireland and Ireland, all of their politics if you go to a pub and order a gin and tonic <laughs> they know how to fucking do mm. it yeah there'll be a menu of gins and a menu of tonics oh I don't like that shit what I like is a normal glass optics gin ice mm-hmm. bit of lemon and then little bottles of tonic yeah Oh, so yeah. you don't get drowned in some flat shout, which is mm. what happens here. Oh, what's your I, very favorite? What's your favorite gin? If you had to pick a gin, I have a bit of a theory about the gins. Mm. I really, a lot of the gins taste kind of nice, mm-hmm. but this fancy gin craze, I think, is a oh, bit yeah. of a capitalist swizz yeah, because yeah. gin is basically vodka or any other clean spirit with berries juniper <laughs> berries mm. and a bit of old botanicals mixed in by someone with a moustache usually these yeah. days yeah. who's hired an illustrator to make a fucking website and a label and is like our artisanal gin yeah mm. hipster gin and so let's all remember that it's just a way of making cheap horrible stuff taste alright yeah it's what the slums in Victorian London yeah. were drinking you had your gin rag mm. Yeah, it was a disinfectant. Exactly. It was like, yeah. And I think the trick is to actually get your better quality tonics. Mm. Interesting. And I will say as a caveat that the Irish Dream... uh, Drum Shambo one, the one in the beautiful Mm -hmm. blue bottle. Mm, Yeah. If you're passing through airports, drum okay. sham, I think it's drum shambo. Okay. Gin is excellent. It's called okay. gunpowder gin. It's got like a really mm. peppery. Yeah. It's good. It's excellent. Have you ever tried any of the Berlin gins? The Mampa? And there's a few, there's a several Berlin. Oh, maybe we should gin. just do a whole gin. Can we just do an episode <laughs> yeah. about booze? Yeah. <laughs> Not will. an episode, if, just if a whole Kai podcast. If Kai becomes the mayor. Fuck we it. Might. <laughs> if we have to live under the GroKo, if the Northern Irish Protocol doesn't go through, mm. if those two things happen, I'm going to give up the politics episode thing. <laughs> it's already called Megan's Megacan. No one really cares about the politics. <laughs> yeah. no. Let's be honest. Ugh. <laughs> 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 Okay. All right. On that note. I'm still drinking. Oh, sorry. Does that mean we have to keep talking until you finish your can? No, but I will say, I think the Gordon's and Tonic is my favorite mega can. Like, it's Mm -hmm. it's a desert island mega can. Daniel, Mm -hmm. thank you so, so much for coming on. Thank you very much. Um, That's great. Makes a nice change from just screaming at you at four in the morning about um, politics which is when we last interacted about this on my birthday. I made an absolute show of myself. Uh, but I had a wonderful time both then and this evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for, for coming on. Me. It was great. And for explaining that to us because it's We look very forward difficult. to the next Brexit nonsense. Yeah. I almost hope I'm not on again because it means it might be resolved. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? Something's <laughs> brewing in Brexit <laughs> exactly. shit show time. We've got to get Daniel on. Okay. Okay. Everyone have a nice time and a nice weekend. Bye. 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 Lovely. <laughs>